the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. I speak to you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Hello everyone online. Hi Annette. It's hard to believe we're already halfway through Lent. This is the middle way, middle point, and also it's the same Sunday that was the last time we had the worship service in the church. It's been quite a year. Our journey continues. And this morning, you know, as I was thinking about that, as we are ready to enter into officially the second year of the pandemic, I was thinking about the whole point of worshiping in the church. The church is where we all want to be. The temple is where everyone wanted to be also. But today's reading in its context, as it currently is in John, challenges us to look at not only what is worship, but where is God? Does God reside in a place? Or is God with us in different ways? You see, the reading this morning from John chapter 2 the story of, the, of Jesus coming in and turning over the money changer tables and creating a whip, which is the only one, John's the only one who says put together a whip and whip, whip the way the animals. Mark, Luke, and Matthew place this story after Palm Sunday in the last few days of Jesus' time in Jerusalem, which creates the sort of the straw that broke the camel's back for the religious leaders, and then the plotting went heavy to get rid of Jesus. But in the Gospel of John, it's at the beginning of the Gospel. And context in Scripture is so important, and the purpose of the writer of Scripture is so important to understand. See, the reading today, as John places this story, not in Holy Week, is that it identifies Jesus and it also talks about how sometimes we make idols that get in the way between us and God. And we heard in our Old Testament reading from Exodus chapter 20, we heard the Ten Commandments. And the first commandment is not to make any other idols 
I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. There's a message in a time of redemption. It's meant to be not rules so much as it is a way of life. When Jesus went into Jerusalem to prepare for the Passover, as the story talks about today, he was taken by the fact that in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their tables. Now, I tried to understand that because was this the common way things were done? Well, some historians say that this was possibly done outside of the temple grounds before possibly even in, in the Kidron Valley, which is just outside of, the, of the Jerusalem itself. But it's possible that the high priest Caiaphas initiated this change and brought the animals and the money changing within, to, within the temple precincts. Now, I'm not a historian and I don't know. But we do know one thing. Jesus, in this version of the story, doesn't focus so much on the fact that the money changers might be cheating people. In the other three Gospels, he says, you're turning it into a den of thieves. In this one, he says, you're turning it into a marketplace. So what happens when you turn something into a marketplace? It's activity, right? It becomes a focus. It becomes an economy. And... We don't know exactly what's in the mind of Jesus, but perhaps what he was trying to say is when you make this into a marketplace, you're taking away the purpose of why you're here to worship. The temple had a purpose, but now it's been turned into this marketplace. And the focus is more on the animals and the money, and maybe a little less on God. Maybe this activity has become such a focus, it has become another idol. And is taking away from what is the reason you're even doing that? Well, it's to worship God. John's Gospel also talks about, you know, Jesus who says, if we will knock down this temple, in three days I will raise it up again. And of course John is very clear to say that he's talking about his own body as a temple. And, it, and remember, the Gospels are written beyond, beyond the, the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. So John is looking ahead. John, John is trying to give a hint further. And that's why it's also at the beginning of, of the Gospel of John. This story is placed in between the miracle at Cana water into wine, and the visit of Nicodemus at night in chapter 3, speaking of spiritual rebirth. This story is focusing on the fact that true worship, true worship is not specifically in a place. True worship is what happens within your heart. To worship is what happens when two or three gather in the name of Christ and worship. We were forced to move out of the church, and we do look forward to the day we go back in. We would never have anticipated in the past that this would be happening. Who could have ever expected that worship would be in the courtyard or online? But it's forced us to really take a look at what do we value in terms of worship? What is it that we really need to worship? Is it the solid pew? Is it the stained glass window that we like to look at? Well, those are all elements that help to maybe foster worship. But they aren't the end goal of worship. The goal of worship is to honor and glorify and praise God. And when Jesus will encounter in chapter 4 of John with the Samaritan woman at the well, 
She questions him and says to him in verses 20 and 21 of John chapter 4, that our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. The Gospel of John is taking us to a point where our beliefs and understandings of what we think God is all about or where we, even where we worship is not exactly the way it has to be or should be or could be. When we're forced to change, we change. We're here. But Jesus is saying true worship is within is himself. We worship Christ. And we hear also in John chapter 9 when the man born blind eventually is encountered by Jesus in that very long narrative story. In verses 35 to 37, Jesus heard that they had driven him out, the blasted blind man, out of the synagogue. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. The Gospel of John will take, takes us on a journey that will eventually lead us to the cross. And as we heard in our reading, our epistle reading, the cross is foolishness. It's foolish. And we become fools for Christ. Oh, thought my battery was going there. <laughs> Worship becomes focused on Jesus himself because Jesus is that temple that is raised after three days. So although we like our places and spaces, ultimately when we gather together as we are today, it doesn't really matter where we gather, Jesus is here with us as he promised. So it's a bit of a challenge the pandemic has forced us to reevaluate even the idol of a building. But I'm not saying we don't want to be back in the church. We do. Especially when the air conditioning is really needed. But it has forced us to think about worship and, and to be creative in ways that maybe we would never have before. And perhaps years from now, we'll look back at this time as a time that has changed the church. But changed the church, when I mean church, I mean the broader church and the body of Christ, perhaps in a good way. It's forced us to look at worship and who we are as Christians in a different way. It's forced us to reach out to people that maybe we would never even have thought of, but because of the pandemic, we want to help as many as possible. Jesus became that stumbling block we heard in 1 Corinthians. The stumbling block that people didn't understand, but we seek to continue to understand. And we don't always understand Jesus 100%. That's part of our life journey as Christians. We're constantly trying to understand and grow in faith. And every time we fall back a few steps we pray that the Spirit will lift us up and move us forward, that we can continue on our journey with Christ. The foolishness of the cross has told us that worship is everywhere, and anywhere, at any time, in any place and space. And our story today reminds us that sometimes we can create situations that get in the way of true worship. The marketplace that's described in our Gospel today became so much a focus that it actually took away from the purpose of why it even existed. And Jesus is trying to tell the people, his followers, and us today, that our priorities and how we understand the world and understand our faith need to be constantly evaluated and re-evaluated.
and just to remember that ultimately it's the grace and love of God that lifts us up. It's not always a place, but the place that God resides is here in our heart. So today it's a bit of a, bit of a challenge that Jesus throws out to us halfway through Lent. We will now continue on our journey with him. We will walk with him as he heads towards Jerusalem and into controversy and into betrayal and crucifixion itself. But in the meantime, we're called to have courage to really take a look at what we believe and why we believe and to move forward with Jesus. And when we don't understand, that's okay. We can say that in our prayers and say, you know, Lord, help me to understand. Help me to know you better. Help me to know your purpose in my life. Help us to know the purpose of our church. What can we do more to be your hearts and hands in this world? That's our Lenten challenge. And we continue with Jesus to Jerusalem and to the cross. Let's just pray for a moment. Loving God, we pray for the courage and passion that Jesus had today in our Gospel reading. We pray for your Holy Spirit to sustain us and guide us in all we do in his name. Continue to help us through our Lenten journey. And may your spirit uphold and bless us as we continue to be the hearts and hands of Jesus in this world. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.